Born in Springfield, Massachusetts, the birthplace of basketball, Bilkis Abdul Qadir is nothing short of a remarkable basketball story. After breaking the high school state scoring record for boys and girls, Bill Keese went on to play for the Memphis Tigers in the NCAA. In 2011, she was awarded the U.S. Basketball Writers Association Most Courageous Award at the NCAA Women's Final Four in recognition as the first Muslim woman to play covered in NCAA history. After her NCAA career came to an end, Bill Keese pursued basketball in Europe. But that dream ended quickly due to a FIBA rule prohibiting headgear larger than five inches. She chose faith over basketball and became an advocate working alongside other Muslim players. After earning her master's degree in 2015 at Indiana State, Bill Keese continued to inspire young Muslim women through sport as an instructor and motivational speaker. Her efforts to instill change finally arrived in 2017 when FIBA overturned the hijab ban. Running programs including Muslim Girls Hoop 2 and Dribbling Down Barriers, Bill Keese is at the forefront of creating opportunity and confidence through basketball. A difference maker that has caught the attention of the highest of offices, Bill Keese Abdul Qadir continues to be a guiding light for the next generation of female athletes. Bill Keese, uh, among the many twists and turns your life has taken, a new journey has started recently, and that is you becoming a mother. How is life right now? Honestly, it's, it's beautiful in a storm all at once. And I say that because the advice that I received before becoming a mother didn't even matter. You know, and to any other future mothers out there, you're going to, it's your own story. It's your own journey. Yes, you can take advice, but learning through experience is really the only thing. And nobody told me it was just going to be like this little tyrant running around your house and controlling you and everything you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, he will have his own story to tell uh, soon enough or even now, but I, I want to start with yours and your journey through basketball. How did basketball become not just part of your life, but much of your life? Yes, yeah, so I was born and raised in a family of eight. I'm the youngest. And every one of my siblings played basketball almost, with the exception of two of my older sisters. They were kind of on the, the I don't want to break a nail side. Um, so I watched my, my older brothers play outside with their friends. And I was like, I want to play just like them. And so while they were playing with their friends, I was outside trying to do every move that they did. Um, and really just be as good as they were. And later down in life, when I was around 12 is when basketball became more of um, not a job, but there was an end goal. And that end goal was to try to lift the financial burden off my parents because they let me know at an early age, they weren't able to afford university. And so I was like, I don't wanna see my parents struggling. So I'm gonna be the best basketball player I can be to try and get a full scholarship and you know lift that burden. And I'm thankful that I was able to actually to get there. And then basketball just became my life, you know, a part of me, which it still is. See more about your parents before we move on to college basketball and on from there. My parents, oh, I love them very, very much, as we all can say that about our parents, but as I grew older, I really started to understand their sacrifices. And now that I'm a parent, I truly, truly understand it. Um, my father battled with many different life obstacles, my mother as well. And to see them actually, you know, join together and raise seven, eight children together and never fold under the pressure, never fold under, you know, the circumstances we were sometimes in just helped me push through my own struggles in life. And I am so thankful to the foundation for the foundation that they laid for me. And um, I'm like, if they could do it in worse circumstances than I am, then I could definitely push past these little tests that I faced throughout my short, well, 30 years is a pretty long time at this point, but <laughs> in my short years of life. Because I'm very struck. I mean, other than the fact that you loved basketball and loved basketball, but as a 12 year old to sort of say to yourself, I 
want to lift this burden from my parents. I am going to get a scholarship to play basketball in college. I mean, that's a very strong heart connection at that age. It is. And, you know, I kind of attribute that to being the youngest and seeing <clears throat> my siblings go through, go through and grow through different things and seeing my parents again, you know, kind of be in a circumstance where it was hard to keep the roof over our head or, you know, it was extra work to have to put food on the table. And so in a way, my older siblings kind of helped me kind of mature faster, I guess. Mm -hmm. And again, when they told me that, I said, I, I don't want to see them sad. Or, you know, as a, as a kid, mm -hmm. you're like, I don't, you don't want to see your parents sad or upset or going through things. So that was, that was my motivation for sure. So you're motivated to be good. You become very, 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 very good. And you set a state record in high school basketball. Um, tell me about that and how you blew everybody else out of the water. So I have, I have a unique situation because I was homeschooled all the way up until eighth grade. Uh, mm -hmm. My parents finally decided me as an eighth grader, we need to send her to school. My mother didn't feel comfortable teaching me past eighth grade. She was in elementary school by profession. Um, in her younger years. So she said, once you reach this, this level, I, I want you to get the, you know, the right educa education. So she sends me to school. Of course, I try out for the high school basketball team. I was in a charter school. So middle school players could play for a high school team. I make the varsity team. And as an eighth grader, I like blew people out the water. They, they didn't even know who I was. I came from nowhere, you know, in my first game, I ended up scoring like 40 something points. And so me coming from homeschool and playing in local community centers, I didn't even know people kept count of your points. So I'm just like, oh, cool. I'm in the newspaper. That's nice. And then the next day they're like, oh, she scores another. So whoever's adding up these points, I was like, when I was told I was getting ready to break a record, I was like, well, what, what record? And to find out it was Rebecca Lobo, a world Olympian, a world champion. I was like, I'm getting ready to break her record. It was amazing, you know, it was a great feeling. And the fact that it still stands today um, is, I guess I should be proud of it. I don't think about it day day to day, um, but I do hope it gets broken. And I hope it's a, a young woman to, to break the record, not a boy. <laughs> I hope so too. So you your intention comes to fruition. You get a full ride scholarship to the University of Memphis. Um, you have an amazing Div 1 college career you're the first woman to play NCAA basketball wearing a head covering. Um, yeah. Was that a topic of discussion? Did you have to talk to the NCAA about it? So I don't ever remember having an actual conversation with the NCAA. However, the process to get my hijab approved on the court was very, very simple. Uh, my team, just the University of Memphis had to just write a letter, get, um, a waiver in place so and I had to carry this waiver or my coaches or the staff carried this waiver whenever we traveled so that if a ref asked why does she have this on I could essentially just show them a paper and say I'm Muslim and it sounds bogus that I had to carry a paper around to prove who I was now that I'm saying it in retrospect <laughs> um but yeah but it was a very very simple process and I had no troubles um during my NCAA years and so, yeah, it was, it was a good fit for me at that time. Did you have any reason to believe that moving on to the next step, there would be trouble? Absolutely nothing. I didn't even think that my hijab would have been in the way of anything, honestly. I'm going to quote you. These are your own words. You say, it's hard being a young Muslim woman in America. It takes strength to walk outside and look different than everyone else. Um, can you say more about that? Yeah, it kind of gave me goosebumps when you hear somebody else say your own words. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm a black Muslim woman and I fit into three marginalized groups. So when I said it takes strength to walk outside and, and look like what I look like, it's a chance that you can run into anybody who doesn't like one of your three identities. And I've been treated unfairly in multiple different places, whether it's airports when I'm traveling, whether it's checking out at a grocery store, whether it's on the court. And 
I honestly want to pride every woman who does fall into a marginalized group, who steps out and is and is all is always themselves, you know, unapologetically, in every given moment because it's hard. Some days I was like, do I want to do this? Do I want to still be who I am? But do we really have that choice, you know? And so, again, basketball for me was that strength that I needed because when I did play, when I stepped out on the court, I was a basketball player. And that's what I wanted to be looked at and seen at. Hmm. So I guess take me through the um, the process with, with FIBA. You have every reason to believe that you can go and play overseas. You encounter this rule that applies to all head coverings. Why? Why? <laughs> like, how could they justify this? What was the actual rule? What did it say? The rule said, almost verbatim, anything larger than a headband could not be worn in the game. Anything larger than an athletic headband. So I think it's probably like five inches wide or whatever the dimensions were. And when I saw that rule, I'm like, okay, well, this is not just an athletic headband. You know, this is a part of my faith, this is a part of my belief, and this is what I've been wearing for so long. So I just thought, oh, let's tell them I'm Muslim, let's tell them I've been wearing it in NCAA, like you would think you saying NCAA would have been fine, you know? However, when we did reach out to them, they said, oh, well, we wanna keep the game religiously neutral didn't have anything to do with the rule in the rule book, you know, and I'm like, okay, well, if that's the case, then I was making statements for other religious, you know, symbols and games that I see day to day. And when we came back with these, you know, these emails and um, just other situations, they said, oh, well, we think you can hurt somebody with your scarf. And that's when I said, no, this, this is <laughs> bogus. Hold on. Like, and it helped me understand that, you know what, it's more to it than just the game. Honestly, that reason there that I could hurt somebody was just like, let's throw this at her because when, you, when it comes to safety in sport, you really can't question it. And I think it was a cop out, honestly. So how did you proceed? How, I mean, who, who was in this fight along with you? Um, what did it take to get this thing ultimately overturned? So at first I thought oh, I was by myself. And I said, there's no way I'm gonna be able to challenge this powerhouse. Like it was like a secret society, this FIBO was, it was hard to get in touch with them. The emails were starting to lag, the communication eventually cut off. There was one other young Muslim woman who I actually played against when I was at the University of Memphis. At that time, she didn't come into, she wasn't wearing her hijab. And when she went to the professionals, she played one year professionally and then came into you know, her own, her own self and her own journey um, religiously. And she started to cover, started to wear her hijab. So she sees my story and she's like, wait a minute, I can't play anymore because I'm, not, you know, I, I now wear my hijab. So what should we do? So we joined forces. Mm -hmm. We created a petition, got over a hundred thousand petitions. I mean, I'm sorry, signatures and FIBA didn't budge. That led to more interviews, more more news articles. I was just, I, I, I promise you, I felt like I told the same story thousands of times. And I, at one point I was like, what am I doing this for? I'm two years in, nothing is happening. I'm not playing, who am I doing this for? And um, it took really big names to push it. And I ended up linking with a neighboring organization in Switzerland and they wrote, they helped me write a letter. They got professional athletes to sign it. And they said a, a few little, I guess, bad media things in Switzerland about FIBA and FIBA didn't like it. So they said, mm -hmm. you know what? Let's try to see what we can do to fix this and rectify this situation. And so it took big names. And then it took for you to kind of call people out publicly to get things going. And that's unfortunate, but we got the job done eventually. I mean, <laughs> I have to wonder what happens to your, your sense of identity um, during this time when you've just been playing basketball and that's your sort of forward motion is based on that and then it's derailed and something else starts to happen. 
So I'm grateful that I guess you, you can say derailed, right? I was knocked off of my track. And I say that because I began to just randomly do speaking engagements. I was asked to do all of these speeches for young kids, and tell my story and um, be a representation of Muslim women in sport or black women in sport. And every time I told my story and what I struggled with, whether it was me questioning my faith, me questioning my hijab, me questioning my, my identity, there was always somebody in the audience who connected, whether they were Muslim, whether they were white, whether they were Asian, whatever, whether they're Christian. Mm. And they were like, I needed to hear this. So for me, I found even more gratification up on these podiums, sharing my story and being able to actually connect rather than connect with somebody by hitting the three or playing good defense. You know, it was just a bigger purpose. And so that's what really kind of kept me going through that whole process. So you found uh, another part of your path as an educator. I know you worked in Memphis for a while and you found your way up north of the 49th parallel to London, Ontario, Canada, which is not too far from me here. Uh, how did that happen? So it was through a public, um, I'm sorry, a, a speaking engagement. And I was invited to speak at a London, the London Islamic School. Random, I ended up speaking there. They called me back for another speaking. They called me back for a basketball camp. And I ran the summer basketball camp for the community. And that's when the people were like, we wanna keep her here. So I'd recently gotten married. Uh, I was still living in Memphis. And after I spent a week running my summer camp there without my husband, I go back to him and I said, you know, I think we're just gonna move to Canada. He's like, what? <laughs> and it was, it, we went, we left within like two months, we got our paperwork together and we ended up just driving from Memphis to London, Ontario with our cat in the back seat. <laughs> And so now you're uh, you're working at the school and you've got a bunch of stuff going on, as I know. Um, what's dribbling down barriers? What's what's that? So <clears throat> dribbling down barriers is a basketball program based off of inclusion, acceptance, diversity. And we want to use basketball as a way to bring kids from all walks of life together. And I always say that uh, sport speaks its own language. And I give the example of having kids from all different countries who don't speak the same language, who can meet on the court, pick up a basketball, and that basketball speaks for itself without anybody sharing any type of words. And I find that to just be so amazing and so unifying. And so with our program, we want to welcome kids from all different neighborhoods, what, whatever your, you know, it doesn't matter if you're rich or if you're poor doesn't, we don't ever want price or money to be, you know, a burden. And so the programs that we run, we've had, just looking at some pictures the other day, so many kids who never even known each other, who are now best friends, who can come into that gym and just have fun and be themselves. And I just don't want any other kid to have to um, experience what I experienced, having to choose between their passion and who they are. And so that's what we try to do. We try to have an inviting environment when we run our basketball program and, you know, just, just bring people together and have fun. That's the main goal. Lucky, so you inspire so many young people now, but I wonder what your advice to a young you would be. A young me, that's a good one. I would say, I would tell my younger self to, to really prepare, prepare for people not to understand who you are. And when you run into those people, know that, know that your strength and your foundation Will, will get you through, regardless of how hard the test is. And so I would tell my younger self to never conform, to always stand by your values because this world doesn't really care about 
who you truly are. You know, sometimes you're going to get looked past, you're going to get looked over and stay the course. I really can't thank you enough. You're very inspiring and this has been truly lovely. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that.